The battle of France is over. The battle of Britain has begun. Upon this battle hangs the fate of Christian civilization. Hitler knows he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the light of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit upland. Let us therefore brace ourselves for our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, then we'll still say, this was their final hour. On June the 18th, 1940, while Winston Churchill was making his defiant speech, on the other side of the world, a ship was sinking. The Royal Mail steamer Niagara hit a German mine and went down in deep water. Locked inside the Niagara's strong room was over eight tons of gold. Gold being sent to America to buy arms and munitions for the war against Germany. Now, that gold lay sealed inside a ship in the middle of a minefield, deeper underwater than anyone had ever worked before. The greatest gold salvage in history was about to begin. An historic item from an old newsreel has just been located, showing the departure from Sydney on her maiden voyage of the Royal Mail steamer Niagara. The Niagara was a triple screw two funnel steamer of 13,415 tons, built by the famous firm of John Brown and Company. Good workmanship and material had been put into her construction and her lines were both graceful and reassuring. The Niagara sailed on its maiden voyage in 1913. It was the first of the grand passenger liners to cross the Pacific, and it signaled the end of the age of the sailing ship. For 27 years, it would sail between Australia and Canada, via New Zealand, Fiji, and Vanuatu. So faithfully did the Niagara perform its duties that by the outbreak of the Second World War, it had traveled more miles than any other passenger ship in the world. At the outbreak of the Second World War, Hitler attempted to cut Great Britain off from the Commonwealth by mining the sea routes to those countries. On June 13 and 14, 1940, as the German army entered Paris, the raider Orion laid 228 mines at the entrance to Auckland Harbour, New Zealand. On the 18th of June, 1940, shortly after midnight, Niagara sailed from Auckland to continue her journey to Vancouver. Stowed in the strong room was over eight tons of gold bullion. There was a very loud explosion at just after 3.30 in the morning, which uh, shook the ship rather badly. And uh, uh, I was in my bunk at the time. We'd worked till midnight. And um, <clears throat> my first recollection of, of this happening was uh, I found myself up against the deck head. The Niagara was 27 miles from land. An SOS was immediately sent. The nearest town was Whangarei. Firstly, uh, my father was awakened by the Whangarei police who had received communication from Auckland police that there had been a sinking of the Niagara outside Whangarei heads. By this time, the the vessel was taking quite a, a list over to port. Now it was fairly simple for the port boats uh, to be put into the water because the side of the vessel was you know, favouring them. We were asked to get moving way out to the scene of the disaster as quick as we could. When we eventually got closer, there they were, on a beautiful, clear, flat car morning. Seventeen of them at sea like a miniature regatta. 
The Wanganella, a passenger ship in the area, was radioed to stand by to pick up survivors. Smaller coastal vessels entered what was now suspected to be a minefield and rescued people from their lifeboats. From these smaller craft, they were transferred to the Wanganella and taken back to Auckland. 148 passengers and the crew of 203 had all been rescued safely. When mines were washed ashore, it was realized what had sunk the Niagara. This is a sister mine that sank the Niagara. Um, it was actually left by the Black Raider. It was washed up onto the beach at Ruakaka in 1941. Uh, it was found in disrepair around the uh, camp. So we've cleaned it up and put it as a focal point for the camp. It was not known how many mines had been laid or where they were. All that was known was that in the middle of that minefield, lying in deep water, was a ship. And that ship carried over eight tons of gold needed for Britain's war against Germany. News of the sinking reached London the same day. The Bank of England cabled the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, giving them the task of finding someone to undertake the salvage. Fortunately for the Bank of England, there was a man in Melbourne waiting for just such an opportunity as this. John Prothero Williams was born in Wales in 1896. He went to sea at the age of 14. Eventually, he migrated to Australia, where he began a stevedoring business. The sinking of a ship at the port of Melbourne started his interest in salvage. When offered the opportunity to salvage the gold from the Niagara, he seized the chance with both hands. Williams contacted diver John Johnston to manage the underwater work. Johnston was a master of the traditional hard hat diving suit. But such a suit was only suitable to a depth of 200 feet. The two men discussed how they could salvage at up to 600 feet. The only possibility they decided would be a diving bell. Such a bell or observation chamber had been used once before but the previous salvers were Italians using a German-built chamber. As both Germany and Italy were now enemies, there would be no possibility of asking them for technical advice. Williams approached a Melbourne engineer, David Isaacs, who designed an underwater observation chamber. When built, the chamber stood nine feet tall and weighed over two tons. The diver would stand inside the chamber and look out the windows. By means of a telephone to the surface, he would simply direct the lowering of explosives or the guiding of hooks and grabs. Sealed inside the chamber, the diver would exhale into a canister of soda lime which would absorb his carbon dioxide and replenish his air from tanks of compressed oxygen. In this way, the diver could stay sealed in the chamber for up to 10 hours. As a second diver, John Johnston's brother Bill was given six months leave of absence from the Royal Australian Navy to join the salvage team. Williams now needed a crew. When I walked into his office, he said, well, uh, I don't need to tell you that uh, uh, you keep this under your hat, but he said, I've, I've got a, an offer to make to you. I'm going to New Zealand to try and raise the gold from the Niagara and I've, I'm making you the offer of joining the, the team. I'm taking 10 or 12 men over there to form the nucleus of the team and uh, I, I'm offering you a position. Well, I mean, what would you do? Wild horses wouldn't have stopped me from, from that moment onward. Williams was also joined by his lifelong friend, Captain James Hurd, who would act as Chief Salvage Officer. Dearest Wynne, I'm looking forward to starting work and have a hunch that it's going to be a most fascinating and interesting job. There are 15 of us working on it and a fine lot of chaps I've never met. Everyone is keyed up and ready to go. I shall have a host of stories to tell you when I return. Williams took his team to New Zealand. Captain Williams told me that before we left to go to New Zealand, uh, 
the Prime Minister at that stage, uh, said, succeed in this and you can name your own reward. Anyway, I found out who he was and where he stayed and uh, I went to see him and uh, I introduced myself and uh, told him that I was a member of the crew of the Niagara and that if he was going to make an attempt to salvage the gold, I wanted to be with him. Anyway, he uh, said, that's great, you know, just keep in touch and uh, subsequently I joined the salvage crew. Williams now needed a salvage vessel. All available ships were being used for the war. The best he could find was a 40-year-old hulk, the Claymore, beached on the mud in Auckland Harbour. Williams hired the hulk from the New Zealand government for £10 a week and set about refitting her. You know, it was, it was a bit of a joke, really. Uh, it was probably the most unseaworthy a uh, vessel I've ever seen in my life. When we got it, all the rigging was rotten. The, um, there was no bridge. Uh, the engine was all seized up and full of birds' nests and rats' nests. And uh, there was grass growing in the decks. Slowly, the old Claymore was cleaned up. Williams commenced recording a daily ship's log. Personal comments in it were almost non-existent, but on December the 9th, 1940, he allowed himself a short but proud observation. It's 12 minutes to 4 p.m. The old tub moves away. No longer SS Claypit, but salvage vessel Claymore. The trip north to the town of Whangarei was 100 miles. The engine broke down four times. That's it for this time. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It's down here somewhere. And for more information on this and other stories and to read the blogs, go to jeffmaynard.net.